first thing I did was the weather. In those days, you got driven by a public service car. You felt really special, I tell you. Driven by a public service car to the weather office in Victoria Street West, which was a grey old wood panelled building. And you found out how the weather was for that day. You had to take maps with you, rolled up maps, take it back to the TV station, put it up on boards, and nothing electronic these days. You know, it's all like that. You'd go along, and then they'd, um, so you'd find out from them what was going on. You had a pointer. Had a special pointer, and I remember the first one I had was broken. Somebody else broke it or chipped the end off it. But funny how you remember those sort of dumb things. However, I did that, and then you, you stand there with this pointer and do the weather. Totally different from today. In those days, news wasn't networked. So in Auckland and in all the other mains, the other three main centres, the news was done from there. So uh, there I go for the news. You In those days, uh, you had a prompter, but it was worked manually. So you often had a problem with the person working it in not being too far or in being too fast or too slow. And you were often going a little bit more, you know, sort of like that, gesturing, trying to get with out of the range of the camera lens, of course, and up or down. And I can remember that distinctly. And then it'd get stuck. But you did have a bit of paper to fall back on. So in actual fact, you had to read off paper. Now, the, the hard part about reading off paper, as I tell the young people these days that I train, is, is actually telling what you're reading. So you learn that very fast. You had nothing electronic. It was all mechanical, which meant it was prone to breaking down. But they had to put the lights up and all that sort of thing, and when you pushed a button or one of the contestants pushed a button, it had to light up. Uh, each time. So you can imagine all the sort of things that happened. However, I went along for an audition for this thing, got it. I think we lasted, well, we lasted one season at least anyway. Well, that was my first foray into it. Um, and to tell you the format of the thing it was basically questions. And you got so many points. You got to 21, first of all. It wasn't quite like playing at the casino or anything like that. But um, uh, it, it was it was a good start for me, actually. Good thing. I'm, I'm glad it never went on too long because we just had so many problems with the mechanics of the whole thing. It was the first time that I think, well, you'd be pretty close. I don't think uh, Peter would have done it before him, Peter Snell, but it was the first time when you'd get the athletes straight after they'd run and interview them. And I remember Murray Helberg. I took a trip away to the Edmonton Commonwealth Games with uh, Murray Helbig and he was telling me, oh, I would never have done that, Barry. Never do that sort of thing. Well, all athletes have to these days, don't they? The one thing I do remember about it was uh, a meeting we held in the Whangarei at uh, Okara Park. It was Okara Park then, the rugby park, and it rained. Someone came along and gave me an umbrella to sit under. I remember that. And then the results would turn up on a sheet of paper and it wasn't long before that was drowned and I couldn't read the results very well. But I, it was very, very exciting and it was so uh, humorous to a lot of people, what was seen on screen, that uh, it was picked up in England and shown as a blooper tape. By in England. I don't think it was the BBC, I think it might have been ITV, but either one. Anyway, it was shown as one of their, uh, their blooper tapes. Look at this poor guy out in the rain trying to get results, can't read them properly. TV One was the station, so we had to pick up the scraps, and uh, and we did, and it was exciting. We used to do a racing program on the thing. We do uh, that's horse racing. We do the trots. We do um, which you don't get much of these days, uh, as well. We do um, we'd get stuff from overseas, clips from overseas. The greatest moment for us was when um, Muhammad Ali came out of the program. Not for me, it wasn't the greatest moment because uh, that weekend I was away uh, doing some, doing, going to some shows in Sydney. I'd been invited there and just this very weekend he had to come along. So Peter Montgomery took over, did a marvellous job and, uh, and I, you know, these days it doesn't matter. Would have liked to have met the man though. Mark Leishman was my co-host on that. We had Ian Ferguson along as a comments person on it. And uh, then we got all these people from different parts of the country, um, from different towns. So they would have um, a team of athletes there, just local people they'd called on. And uh, we'd have a crew of about 50. 
So he had one heck of a team there. Another labour-intensive thing, that's why it died in the end. We didn't do the big centres. We might have done one at Newtown one time, I think. No, that was a track series. But basically, it was to the heartland of New Zealand. Pick out some little town, they'd be right behind it, the crowds would roll up, and away we'd go with this sort of thing. The other innovative thing about it all was that the, um, was the crew had to uh, build all the gear for it all the bits and pieces, all, all the sets and everything for the thing. And that was a heck of a job. And they would spend, the crew would spend the rest of the week actually just going around to the next place, pulling down and, um, and then putting it all up again at another town. But the towns loved it. And I loved it too. I thought long and hard about it. Um, I had people saying, oh, what do you want to do that for? Oh, that's very bad for your profile, you know. But I'd been introduced to uh, Steve Rickard, who was the promoter. Ernie Leonard I knew very well. He explained it all to me, and I thought, no, damn, this is going to be good fun. But the other thing about it all was it did, it did appeal to all ages and to women as well. People loved it, you know, women with handbags belting the wrestlers. And uh, then you, after the show, they would hang around outside the dressing room door. You know, it was real old... Old movie days, hang outside the back door till the star came out, you know. And they'd be age 16 to 60. But look, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And uh, it was sad when it went, but um, that was inevitable um, because we weren't just getting the stars coming through. The other things, we didn't really have the backup of the local wrestlers. There just weren't the numbers there and they weren't quite as professional as the overseas ones. I'm not trying to be disparaging, but... But it, it, it was new, it was new, Steve dreamed it all up and, um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it again. That's hard work, it really is hard work. But you see, you, what you got there was a heck of a lot of talent that we never saw on television, never ever knew about. And it was a great variety show and people were right in and got into it and once again, uh, everybody, all the, the local population got into it and they came along and gave their thousands, as you know, uh, at the time. So um, that was great. Some of the things you had to do got a bit embarrassing at times because there were sort of, um, there, was, there were no uh, barriers or anything like that. Well, just give it a go. Give it a go, Barry, sort of thing. And uh, sometimes you made an absolute joe of yourself. But it was all part of the fun, wasn't it, really, you know. And they got those overseas stars here as well. And it, it was a lot of fun. Once again, very expensive to run. Now that was trying, because there I was in a suit, mind you. Suit, dress shoes. We'll take you up to the top of Coronet Peak Barry and uh, do it up there, film. Now, the big mistake they made was by doing the long shots, you know, with you in the distance sort of thing, getting the scenery and all that sort of thing. Biggest mistake they made was doing those shots first. So when it came round to doing the close-ups with the message and me giving the message, by this time, my mouth had frozen up. I was getting so cold, <laughs> just standing in a suit in the snow. So what they had to do was get the helicopter, take me down, give me some hot coffee, and we had to go all the way down to Queenstown Airport, get some hot coffee into me so I could talk again, and then up we went in the helicopter again and did the rest of it. It'd be nice to be famous without being well known. <laughs> you cannot just, it's a ridiculous statement. But I think you know what I mean. Uh, you know, great to be able to do that, but there, are, uh, there is the downside of it, of course, that you're wandering around all the time known, aren't you? you know, and there's something, and I'm sure anybody who's worked in television and when they finished it, uh, love the fact that there's a little bit more uh, anonymity, a bit more of a private life. But because of all that innovation, I've just, I've just loved it. I got chances to see places around the world, to go around the world to places, to do different things, to see lots of New Zealand, to meet lots of New Zealanders as well. So I, um, I certainly would uh, do it all again. Mm -hmm.